So today we have my colleague, Dr. Anthony Wong, um, from the Moya Moya program here at UCLA Health. I'll let him introduce himself uh, and the topic of the day, Moya Moya. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and thank you for joining me. Today I have the privilege of talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and of great interest, Moya Moya. This disease is an important contributor to stroke in a lot of patients of all ages. What happens and defines this disease is that the normal blood supply to the brain carried here, you see this vessel coming up into the brain, kind of peters out and eventually degrades completely and is instead replaced by a small network of vessels that have expanded in order to accommodate its loss. I should mention that on this picture, this is an angiogram looking directly at a patient on the right side and then on the left side. So this shows the blood vessels that supply the brain. You'll notice that here, there's a relative lack of blood flow in blood vessels. And this, it's this appearance of the collateral vessels that have expanded that defines the term moya moya. And so you'll hear me use different terminology today, uh, which are very similar, but I want to make sure that uh, the distinction is clear here first. So moya moya angiopathy, um, I'll use that term just to refer to that appearance on, um, on the angiogram, because when we see that, one really important aspect of uh, the next steps uh, in, in taking care of patients is uh, trying to determine what the reason for that appearance is. And so one, uh, one reason that I'm going to focus on today is moya moya disease. Now, moya moya disease is the appearance of moya moya angiopathy on both sides. Um, by definition, the, the disease is progressive and idiopathic, meaning that uh, there's no underlying cause, and be that's because um, another entity called Moya Moya syndrome, sometimes called quasi Moya Moya, um, refers to the development of Moya Moya angiopathy in the presence of pre known predisposing conditions. Some of the important ones include trisomy 21 or sickle cell disease. Um, there is also a separate entity um, uh, called atherosclerosis, which occurs when it occurs in the brain, we term intracranial atherosclerosis, which can cause similar appearances. Moya moya shows up in lots of different ways because it affects lots of patients different ways. Now, um, one way that it can cause symptoms or uh, present is by causing uh, insufficiency of blood flow in large parts of the brain. So. Sometimes this affects motor function, sometimes this affects sensory function. Uh, in the right locations, it can affect your ability to speak or understand. Um, it presents in other ways too. Uh, it can present as seizure. It can present um, as, as syncope, which, is, uh, which sometimes manifests as lightheadedness or dizziness when standing up, which obviously is a very common thing uh, for, that we all experience, but when it happens uh, you know, uncommonly uh, frequently, uh, it, it gives us some indication. Um, it can sometimes result in personality change or cognitive dysfunction, uh, which is an important component of moya moya that, that can be particularly difficult to treat. Uh, there are a couple of other clues. Uh, every year during the winter, we see patients uh, who find moya moya um, because it can be precipitated by hyperventilation or dehydration. So sometimes pay, uh, Folks will go skiing in the mountains, they'll get dehydrated, they're working hard and hyperventilating um, and have some of these other symptoms. And, and so every year we find some patients uh, who, who have an underlying moya moya condition in that way. One of the uh, kind of notable uh, features of moya moya -moy disease vessels is that the collateral circulation that forms in order to accommodate for the loss of the large vessels is a little bit more fragile. And so uh, bleeding in the brain is an important uh, presentation of moya moya, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, in the next few slides. Um, the lack of blood flow and the resulting uh, increase in the size of collaterals um, uh, 
and the search for uh, other sources of blood flow can sometimes result in headaches. So uh, oftentimes Wamoya patients have headaches. And then finally, uh, the, the dilation, uh, the increase in size of some of the uh, smaller vessels uh, can result in the formation of aneurysms, um, which are an important risk factor for, for bleeding. When Moya Moya presents, uh, it is typically in young patients. Sometimes that is in young children. Uh, this, is, this is age groups and years right here. So there's a peak of presentation with ischemic symptoms around the, between the ages of five and 10. And then there's a second peak in presentation around the age of 35 to 45. Um, again, uh, it, most of these patients present with some kind of ischemia, but a lot of patients, uh, especially in adults, uh, also present with, with bleeding or hemorrhage. Just some statistics about how frequently we see Moya Moya. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very rare disease, but in certain populations, it's a lot more common than others. In North America, we have uh, a, a, a wide variety of ethnic backgrounds, and we see Moya Moya present in all of them. Um, however, in some, in some backgrounds more frequently than others. And this is reflected in uh, international statistics. This is not a well-characterized disease in, in Western Europe or in Africa, um, but in East Asia, it's, uh, it, it happens far more commonly uh, than we see in the United States population as a whole. Uh, it also uh, shows a slight female preponderance and as I mentioned before, this is a very important component of, uh, of uh, strokes in children. So overall, uh, again, we see it in children. We see it pop up in young children. We see it pop up in young adults. Uh, we see it slightly more commonly in women than in men. Um, and we see it uh, slightly more commonly in uh, East Asian populations than other populations uh, as far as we know. So the diagnosis and characterization of, of a patient with Moya Moya, when I first see someone in clinic, starts with symptoms. So oftentimes patients have ischemic symptoms, stroke-like symptoms. Sometimes they're, they're, they're larger um, and more comprehensive in presentation, like motor problems or speech problems, but often they're very subtle. And uh, so the first thing that we try to characterize is the a patient's symptoms. We try to determine whether the condition is hemodynamically significant. As I mentioned, a lot of patients they will find the, uh, this condition when the conditions are exacerbated or kind of ideal for, uh, for the presentation. And so we, we try to determine, you know, is this something that can be brought on um, with how close are, is, uh, is a patient to having uh, a kind of a la an important lack of oxygenation in their brain? And then finally, we need to determine whether it's unilateral, whether it's bilateral. As I mentioned, Moya Moya disease is defined by the condition being bilateral. But also, we need to determine which side is worse. And that's most often and most importantly defined by symptoms. But we also use imaging to uh, help us in this determination. These days, MRIs are very commonly accessible, and so the most, uh, most commonly we, we find patients diagnosed based on MRI. But uh, angiography, catheter angiography, is a, is a critical component in the diagnosis of, of patients with Moya Moya because we need to understand the, the entirety uh, of, their, of their vascularity and of their blood flow patterns. Um, we sometimes will use uh, evoked uh, imaging studies in order to understand um, how close someone is to having critical uh, lack of oxygenation uh, in areas of their brain, also to understand which areas of their brain are, are most affected. And then finally, I mentioned uh, that cognitive decline is, is an important component of Moya Moya that's maybe a little under-recognized and a little under-addressed. And um, in, in our program, we, we routinely obtain neuropsychometric testing, which is basically an a, a extended battery of IQ tests in order to help patients understand uh, and identify areas that the Moya Moya may be affecting in terms of their higher order cognition, but that also gives us the opportunity to, to intervene with, with brain exercises um, and also kind of sh helps us identify areas that a patient needs to focus on in order to identify progression in the future. 
So uh, this is a little bit of a recap, but we see moy moy in patients in children um, and in young adults. There is uh, a familial condition um, that is pretty rarely seen with moy moy. So it's pretty rare that we see this in families. Most of the time, it's, it's a random occurrence in the single uh, patient. Um, what we, what we find after a patient presents and is discovered to have moe moe is that a huge majority of them progress. As I mentioned, moe moe disease is defined by progression, but uh, the statistics show us that a huge majority will have recurrent strokes within a few years if we don't intervene. That's not everyone. So one of the really important aspects of my job uh, is, to, is to identify patients um, you know, who will are most likely to benefit from surgery, but then also the ones who may not. The other aspect is that, again, a huge majority of patients will experience intellectual and motor delays uh, in the upcoming years. And so we want to be really careful about our evaluation to, uh, and our follow-up in order to uh, help patients avoid this, at, if at all possible. So we talk, we're, we're kind of going to focus on what is traditionally moe moe disease. But um, as I mentioned, there are uh, different aspects of moe moe that kind of result in atypical presentations uh, of, the, of the condition, of the, uh, the appearance of moe moe angiopathy that we must always consider. And the reason why is because we treat these patients differently. Uh, each of these patients may require uh, a different approach. And so our philosophy here at UCLA is to take a very individualized approach to each patient uh, and try to determine um, which of the variety of treatment uh, approaches and kind of treatment options are going to be the most appropriate and give them the best chance at a long and normal life. Very generally speaking, treatment of moe moe disease is surgical. Now, there are certain risk factors that we know of that may reduce the risk of progression to stroke. Uh, these include genetic conditions, uh, the age at onset, gender, and then uh, alcohol use. There are probably other risk factors that we just haven't identified, and that's one of the ongoing projects that we have uh, going on here at UCLA. Very generally speaking, the reason why uh, surgical treatment is considered to be essentially the only treatment for moe moe disease is uh, survival curves like this one. Basically, every, sur every study that's been done on outcomes with moe moe looks basically like this, in that if you identify the disease early and treat it surgically, you can largely halt the occurrence of stroke. Whereas if you don't do surgery, you can expect over many years the development of uh, stroke and other problems. This is also true for hemorrhagic uh, presentation. This is true in children. Uh, this is uh, true in, uh, for neurocognitive outcomes. This is actually even true in headache. And uh, part of the reason why, as I mentioned, uh, is that moe moe is a progressive disease. And we grade moe moe in terms of the development of collaterals and the degradation of the normal vasculature. And so there's a very well-known progression of moe moe disease where the normal vasculature degrades and collaterals, uh, collateral vessels form in order to accommodate for their loss. So the grade of moe moe, the degree of progression is important in determining the appropriate treatment for a patient. In addition, we use uh, the symptoms, the, uh, the way that it's affecting a patient very heavily. That uh, weighs a lot on the way that we make decisions. In addition, we use advanced imaging. Uh, as I mentioned, perfusion MRI um, that we use to identify both underlying lack of blood flow, responsiveness to stress conditions that may indicate how close one is to, uh, to stroke, and then also uh, in order to determine cerebral metabolism. The, there are certain imaging findings that may indicate that the brain is, the brain circulation or collateral circulation is stressed uh, to, is maximized in terms of its ability to accommodate. Um, so we look for those signs. 
In addition, not all collaterals are the same. And so we look at the pattern of collateralization, and there are some conditions that may indicate a higher risk or a lower risk for patients. And so uh, this just is just one example of those choroidal anastomoses, which uh, are very helpful when they form uh, in order to avoid ischemia, but also do predict a higher risk of bleeding in the future. And so these patients, when we see this condition, we know that we really need to be aggressive about, about intervention. All in all, the goal of surgery is to augment flow, to replace flow in the areas that it's needed. And we use a lot of these diagnostic techniques clinical examination, neuropsychometric testing, imaging, in order to identify the areas of greatest need so that we can target them. So ideally, we see a, a, a picture like this, where a patient, and this patient is really obvious right here in this circle, uh, where the lack of blood flow is, right where the lack of vascularity is. Here, after bypass, that bypass fills the vascularity in that area. And so this is essentially the goal in, in every case. The way that we do that are variations on this technique. And so I'm just going to give a little overview of, of what, this, what this bypass surgery is. There are several variations. There are uh, many adjuncts that we employ that are maybe beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today, but are an important part of the, uh, the armamentarium that we can bring to, the, uh, to bear in the care of these patients. So uh, this is just a little drawing. Uh, what we do is take the scalp arteries and we use them, we, we plug them into the brain arteries and sew them in so that the scalp arteries, uh, the blood flow through the scalp can be used to supply the brain instead. This is what it looks like in real life. This vessel right here is plugged into this brain vessel um, and it's, uh, now it supplies the brain. So I'm just going to give an example of a patient that we took care of. This is um, a, a, a young woman who found her moimoya in singing. Um, as I mentioned, hyperventilation and, and, uh, can lead to uh, the exacerbation of, of the moimoya condition. And so this was discovered when she was singing. And what we see here in this injection is uh, this is a common carotid artery injection, so we see both the uh, internal carotid circulation, which supplies the brain, as well as the external carotid circulation, which supplies the scalp. Same thing on the left side. This is the internal carotid artery, so the, the uh, supply to the brain, and then externally the supply to the scalp. So the external carotid circulation is what we have to use as a donor, whereas the internal circulation is what we're trying to augment. Now, this Imaging is incomplete. There's other supplies to the brain, and so it's important to look at those. But in this particular patient, this, this image kind of tells the story. Just go back to that last image. I just wanted to point out for the audience that <clears throat> may, maybe not used to looking at angiograms is that this carotid artery should fill the entire brain um, that's visible from this projection with blood flow. And you see it kind of peters out to just a little bit of blood flow into a very small amount of the brain here. Same thing on the other side. So this is around the right eye, and this is the left eye, looking at, straight at the face. Um, and so this is a profoundly low blood flow. And these are skin vessels. So these are the vessels that we may end up using for surgery to give more blood flow to the brain where it really needs it. I just want to make sure that was clear on the pictures. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, so we employ uh, a, a general kind of decision matrix, uh, an, an algorithm for uh, kind of evaluating what techniques, what adjuncts are appropriate in what situations. And there, there's a lot of detail in here and there's a lot of evaluation in here. So well, we, 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 try to, we try to use every tool we have in order, in order to take care of Moi Moi patients as well as we possibly can. And this is just an example of the way that we make those decisions. But in this particular patient, um, uh, she was found to have Moi Moi disease and not one of the uh, other conditions that cause Moi Moi angiopathy. She was symptomatic. Uh, the, uh, the effect was uh, on speech and motor function, um, and it was mostly involving both her MCA and her ACA territories, and so we settled on using these techniques in her care. So there's a lot of preoperative decision-making that goes on. Um, 
every patient's uh, decision making is taken uh, individually, is customized, and we go over these decisions together because these are very complex decisions and require a great deal of education. Intraoperatively, we also make a lot of decisions right, in identifying the, the right, in matching the right recipient with the right donor. And uh, so just uh, to mention some of the considerations that we use, um, in, uh, intraoperatively, we look at the size of the vessels, we look at the intended targets, we look at the flow rates and the direction of flow in order to understand uh, right then and there where our best options are. And here's an example of what this operation looks like. We're going to start by isolating the donor vessel. In this case, it's a scalp artery. And then we're going to isolate the recipient artery. Just for reference, this artery is about a millimeter and a half uh, in diameter. Then we open the donor artery, and then we take the, reci uh, the recipient artery, and we suture the donor artery onto the recipient. This part of the operation takes about 15 or 20 minutes to do. And this is probably the most critical part and emphasizes why the whole team uh, around the care of patients um, in, in this situation is really important. Our anesthesiologists are very familiar and comfortable with this condition, but we, we take a lot of care and keep really strict parameters during the performance of this operation uh, in order to keep it as safe as possible. So once we finish with the uh, front side of the anastomosis of the uh, bypass, then we complete the back side in much the same way. In order to keep that opening as wide as possible, we do this at an angle in order to increase, increase the surface area of the, the opening. And then once we've completed that process, we test our anastomosis. So just for the audience who may not be familiar, this is suturing one of the skin vessels to one of the brain vessels, and that's why they call it a bypass. It goes around the blockage of the vessel going to the brain, the carotid artery, and the base of the skull, and the skin vessels then come around to bypass that blockage to provide blood flow to the brain that needs it. And these are usually 9-0 or 10-0 sutures uh, for the non-surgeons. These are very small sutures. Some say about one-fourth the size of a human hair. Uh, and this is done under a microscope, a surgical microscope, um, under high magnification. So this is what it looks like when it's complete. And we do some evaluation during surgery in order to show that it's, uh, that it's open, that it's patent. And here we use a, a fluorescent dye injected through the veins in order to show that, uh, that it's open and that the new blood supply is doing what we want it to do. And so this is what we accomplished in this case. Again, before surgery, we see the absence of blood vessels here in the brain on both sides. And after surgery, what we've provided is blood flow through the arteries that went to the scalp, now going into the brain on the right side, and similarly on the left side. Looking from the side, this is the right side, and this is the left side. And what's notable is that the brain has taken that blood supply and redistributed it to the various parts of the brain that really needed that blood flow. And so this and similar outcomes are what we're hoping to provide in every case. Now, it takes a village to provide the best quality of care uh, for Moya Moya patients. It's a very complex disease. And this list of name includes a lot, but not everyone, not by a long shot, uh, who contributes to the care of Moya Moya patients here at UCLA. Without every single name on this list, we wouldn't be able to provide the level of quality that we do. And uh, so every single person on this list deserves a, a huge thank you. Great. Thank you, Anthony. So, I mean, I want to emphasize the multidisciplinary nature of um, taking high-level care of rare but very important diseases like Moya Moya. Anthony's done an amazing job helping 
uh, coalesce this team. And uh, you know, our goal at UCLA Neurosurgery is to provide the best care we can for Moya Moya patients. Um, there's been literature in many, many fields of medicine that shows uh, the more condensed and high volume a center is, the better the outcomes for a particular disease process. And I think that's no different from Moya Moya, which is why we're making a very concerted effort to make a, a center uh, full of experts uh, who have a lot of experience with this disease process. Anthony, a few questions. So thanks for the great talk. Um, you know, if someone comes in uh, freshly diagnosed with Moya Moya disease, I'm sure that's a very scary thing and maybe a confusing time for a patient. Um, let's say they come in with an MRA or MRI, a blood vessel study using an MRI, um, showing that they have Moya Moya disease and they come to your clinic. Like, what is the process of going through the workup and then eventually treatment um, for, you know, your average standard patient? So. The first and most important thing that I try to convey to patients that I am meeting for the first time is that they have time to make an educated decision for themselves. This is a complex disease. These are complex conditions. And every patient deserves the time and attention and workup uh, that it takes to make uh, a, the best kind of personalized plan for that, that patient in that situation. Every patient's a little different. So we start by... Uh, trying to lower the risk of uh, more events as much as we can. Things as simple as staying well hydrated and taking baby aspirin. And then we move on to imaging and the neuropsychometric uh, testing evaluation. So uh, we get an, an angiogram in every patient. Uh, we get the advanced MRI uh, sequences that, that we use in, in the targeting and evaluation of, of patients. And then once we have that information, we sit down together and we have a long discussion about uh, what, uh, what each patient's options are. Now, I'll never tell anybody that they have to do anything in particular, uh, especially in complex situations like this one. It takes a lot of nuance and certain, and, and, and there are a lot of factors that go into that decision that uh, I may not be able to fully appreciate, such as uh, someone's family situation, um, the, the other risk factors that they may, that they may have, and so we sit down and we have a long conversation about uh, what the options are and how uh, our team's approach uh, and recommendations uh, may, uh, may best benefit each patient. So from there, if a patient uh, decides to have surgery, then we, we bring them in and have surgery. That hospitalization is generally pretty short. You come in the day of surgery, you have surgery, a few days later you leave, go home, uh, the recovery it takes a little while to get back to normal, but patients who like their jobs are usually asking to go back to work after a couple of weeks. Patients are usually asking to go back to school after a week before parents are generally comfortable with it. Uh, and then after that, it's a long process. You're not rid of me for a long, long time. We'll follow for a long time, making sure that things don't progress, making sure that, that everything is optimized. But all in all, the care of Moy Moy patients is extremely rewarding. We expect patients to do really, really well in the huge majority of cases. And my job, our job, is really just to make sure that, uh, that, we, that we get the very best uh, situation for every single patient. Great. Thank you, Anthony. So you know, another question that often comes up is, um, you know, why does this happen? I mean, I know there's some genetic factors, there's a variety of factors, but like in a general sense, like why do these blood vessels narrow and close down? Um, and do you have any sense of that? Or is it, um, you know, or you can maybe describe how that process happens, even if we don't know the exact cause. So Moya Moya disease, the, I'm going to stick to this condition because some of the other, uh, the other conditions that surround Moya Moya have different uh, etiologies and different contributing factors. But Moya Moya disease is known to occur by cellular overgrowth of certain layers of the blood vessels that supply the brain. Now, the reason why that happens is still uh, something of a mystery. There are certain genetic findings that, that may predispose to this happening, but it's, even if someone has those genetic conditions, that doesn't make them uh, you know, definitely uh, at risk or even likely to develop the condition. So. When, when this cellular overgrowth occurs, it, it occurs gradually, but at different rates. Uh, and so as that process occurs, then the 
uh, on the other side of the the ledger, the the brain is providing collateral circulation to accommodate that that loss at the same time. Perfect. Um, I know you showed a graph about long term. The surgery tends to really help prevent future strokes. Um, is that effective surgery immediate, or is it something that takes a while for it to kind of, you know, the, the bypass to work, or how do you think about that, that issue? So that's an important question in the care of moi moi patients in that it gets to the selection of techniques that we use. So there very generally are uh, direct bypass techniques, which involves plugging a, a donor artery directly into a recipient artery, and then there are indirect bypass techniques where you provide sources of blood flow nearby to the brain, and then the brain grows its own vascularity from these sources. That process takes time, uh, and so in certain cases, uh, in patients who uh, may be more appropriate for a direct bypass, we will favor that, and in patients who may be more appropriate for an indirect bypass, we'll favor that. And uh, this kind of gets to the, the, the individual uh, uh, nature of, the, uh, of our program and, and, and our approach in that we try to select the best combination of techniques for each individual situation. Excellent. So, you know, a common question I hear, you know, uh, maybe we can address here, which is if you're going to have surgery on your brain, uh, you know, do you have to have all your hair shaved off? As good as your haircut is, you know, there may be some in the audience that don't, don't want, you know, a completely uh, short haircut. So, so what, is your, what is your usual methods for, for, for taking care of the hair and cranial surgery? Yeah, this is, in my mind, a very important question that a lot of patients uh, maybe feel a little bit uh, embarrassed to ask. And um, in my mind, it's bad enough that you have to have brain surgery. You shouldn't have to look like you did, too. And so... Uh, my approach is to minimize the cosmetic impact. The, the reality is most patients after they have this surgery, you know, even as soon as they can wash their hair, which is just a couple days after surgery, you really can't see it uh, at all. Yeah, same, same for my practice. Uh, just a very narrow strip of hair, and if you have a little bit longer hair, it often you can kind of comb it back and you don't even see uh, that you've had surgery recently. So I think that's an important sort of point uh, that helps speed the patient's recovery and their comfort level with surgery. All right. Um, well, I appreciate you coming and talking about moi moi disease, an extremely important, um, you know, cause of strokes in young people, which is obviously something as physicians we really want to help avoid, particularly when they come in with symptoms that aren't strokes, but just symptoms when we can prevent a stroke. Um, and I think these bypass procedures have been, you know, well tested to be uh, extremely effective uh, in the right selected patient population. And, um, you know, I think you've done a great job building the program here. And uh, like we said, it takes a village and, and, um, and, you know, this group expertise is very important in the outcomes of these patients. So thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate Dr. Wong coming and uh, sharing his expertise. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Anthony.